welcome everybody. So glad to have you with us. And now I would like to welcome Nancy Raquel Mirabal, a board member of Teaching for Change and one of the two groups that's coordinating the Zen Education Project. And uh, Nancy is going to conduct the interview with Kelly Lytle Hernandez today, the author of Bad Mexicans, Race, Empire, and Revolution in the Borderlands. I'm so excited for this conversation. Well, welcome everyone. Um, this is such a treat. I am so honored to be here to conduct the interview. Um, first of all, um, Dr. Lytle Hernandez, I wanna congratulate you on your book, um, Bad Mexicans, Race, Empire, and Revolution in the Borderlands. Um, it is truly beautifully written. Um, and you did such a brilliant job of fleshing out the different historical figures and providing us such an intimate uh, reading of events. It really felt like you were right there in the rooms, um, reading the newspapers, just having these intimate conversations. You also detailed the hardships and the toll political organizing and revolution took on the activists and their families. And it's just so well done. As I was reading your book, um, I was reminded why the Mexican revolution is so important to not only Mexican history, but also the history of the United States. And um, so for my first question, uh, the Mexican revolution begins in 1910 and it ends around 1917. But your book focuses on the period before the revolution. So my first question is, um, why did you choose to focus on the period before the revolution? Sure, and that's a great question. And first, let me thank the Zen Education Project and you, Nancy, and Teaching for Black Lives for the, just a chance to be here in conversation and community with you all. Um, so why did I focus on the, the pre-revolution period or the storm before the storm, as some say? Well, this book is about a particular group of instigators, of rebels, of insurgents who were active between roughly 1900 and 1910. And their primary role um, was not to go on and lead the armed struggle or the political struggle of the formal revolution, but rather to sow the seedbed of insurgency to open up the, the radical possibilities. Um, and so that group is um, journalists and miners and cotton pickers and farm workers who um, come from Mexico to the United States, as well as a group of Mexican Americans who are led by someone named Ricardo Flores Magón, led is probably too strong of a word. Um, they are a collective and they're often known as Magonistas. And what's so important about them is that before the revolution gets into its armed struggle and before people begin to battle over what can actually be applied immediately, they want to think about the radical possibilities, right? Um, I think in some ways we could imagine our abolition movement today as being the, the ally to their movement in the past, that they want to think beyond um, what structures are currently in place and what is possible for workers, for the dispossessed, for the historically marginalized and aggrieved, especially racially aggrieved communities, what's really possible so that we can have full, whole, healthy, vibrant lives. Wow, yes. Um, it also looks at activism and organizing that takes place in US and Mexico. And one of the things that this book does so beautifully, so well, is that it shows that the organizing is taking place in the United States. And that St. Louis, Missouri, for instance, becomes the center of this kind of organizing. And there's Texas and Montreal and uh, all, all over the US. We know that the Partido Liberal Mexicano, the PLM, is even founded in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, as you tell us. And so in the newspaper, Regeneración moves from Mexico to the US and that Ricardo Flores Magón is traveling through most of the United States giving speeches um, and he's in conversation with other activists. So given the importance of this revolution and the United States is a role in it, why do you think the Mexican revolution should be taught more as part of US history 
Um, and what can young people learn from the Mexican Revolution? Sure. Well, I think this story about Ricardo Flores Magón and the Maguanistas and the, the Mexican Revolution should be a part of the canon of the so-called American or U.S. history story. Why is that? Well, first and foremost, um, during the Mexican Revolution, 1910 and 1917 roughly, about a million Mexicans migrate to the United States in search of sanctuary as refugees and as labor migrants. And that mass migration really is the foundation of the birth of a large Mexican American population um, that we see today. So if you wanna talk about major moments that transformed who we are as a people here in the United States, the Mexican Revolution is certainly a part of that story. So for that reason alone, we should be thinking about the Mexican Revolution within the, the US history canon. In addition to that, why I really like this particular group of rebels who are active before the revolution gets started, who helped to incite it, is they really bring to the table the most radical sets of possibilities um, and questions that become a little squashed as you move toward um, developing the constitution and implementing the cost constitution. But if you wanna think about non-white immigrant groups and what kind of radical possibilities and thinking um, and politics that they bring to the United States, the Magonistas are at the center of that story. And I think that's really important for us today. A lot of people are talking about the, the so-called Hispanic Republican and whether or not this new voting body will be Democratic or Republican. And the Magonistas really explode all of that and say, no, <laughs> we actually want to be anti-capitalist. Um, in many cases, we want to be anti-racist. And the sets of solutions that are being offered to us by the leading parties aren't what we're about. We're imagining outside of that. We're working outside of that. So I think that's also important that there's a legacy here for radical Latinx organizing. Um, and so there's a lot of stories here. Also, for example, there's major things that have happened in US history that Mexicans and Mexican-Americans have been written out of, right? And completely ignored. Let me give you one example. Um, there are a few institutions as significant or as well known as iconic as the Federal Bureau of Investigations, the FBI. Typically when we hear the story about the FBI, if you know much about it, maybe it's um, Hoover was at the beginning of the FBI or, or maybe the, um, the Red Scare and the efforts to arrest Emma Goldman and others. Well, if you keep peeling back the layers, you go back to the very beginning of the FBI in the summer of 1908, which is when they're established. Um, they're established just a couple of days after this group of Mexican rebels, the PLM, launched their most lethal raids against um, the dictatorship in Mexico. They launched those raids from Texas. And so right as the FBI is getting started in the summer of 1908, um, those raids happen, and so U.S. Department of Justice and no one, no one less than Teddy Roosevelt pivot the beginning of the FBI, and they make sure that the FBI is one of the first big cases is hunting down the, the Magonistas and trying to suppress the outbreak of the 1910 Mexican Revolution. So this is another example of how telling this, this radical story um, helps us to understand that Mexico and Mexican Im immigrants and Mexican Americans are really at the center of so many so-called American stories, but we've been ignoring it to date. And we have got to begin um, expanding our understanding um, of US history. And there are so many examples of that throughout the book. Um, and I, I just thought that that was um, so brilliant. Now, one of the things that I thought that you did so, so well is that the leader of the, the PLM, Ricardo Flores Magón, is a very complicated figure. And you capture his nervous energy, his persistence, his really fierce intelligence, and almost perfectionism um, throughout the um, book. And, but he's also a man of his time, right? He's got, he's got some issues <laughs> and he can be very complicated. So um, how did you navigate those contradictions and, and why did you think it was important to have this kind of portrait of Magon? Uh, thank you. So um, much of the writing that's been done on Ricardo Flores Magon, not all, but much of it is, um, it sets him up as an icon, right? As an unproblematic icon, as someone who was 
brilliant and daring at a time when nobody else would name the dictatorship a dictatorship at a time when nobody else would really speak truth to power when it came to the United States government. He was doing all of that, absolutely. But the man who um, had the brilliance and the courage to really slash out at the dictatorship was also the man who would lash out at his friends and his comrades. And so one of the greatest um, weaknesses of his leadership, I would argue, is that he wasn't able to build a strong political community um, around him because of some personality issues. I think it's really important to give the full story of who we are as movement participants, and in this case as a movement leader, that he was an imperfect person, uh, but he went on to really challenge uh, the United States government and the Mexican government. Um, so I think it's really important for this to tell the whole story. I have to also say that this is my, my quarantine book. I wrote this while we were all in shutdown, but it's also my uprising book and the uprising for black life that was unfolding in 2020, in the summer 2020 in particular, as I was writing about Ricardo Flores Magón and I'm, I'm quite active in the movement and mass incarceration. In, in many ways, I was watching some dynamics play out on the ground that I was seeing in the archive. And I felt like I could understand him a little bit better after 2020 than I had prior to that. Um, love him, right, in many ways, but also understand the limitations of his leadership. And for him in particular, it was around gender and sexuality, um, that he would excise people from the movement if he felt that, um, well, if they didn't agree with him politically, he would then out people um, around issues of gender and sexuality. So I just felt like it was really important to tell his whole story. Um, no, I mean, I have to say I was familiar with Magon, but I felt like I didn't know him until I read your book. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, this is a, a much more different um, reading of Magon. And I thank you for that because the portrayals have been sometimes um, almost uh, lionized, right, as you mentioned. So towards the end of the book, as we move closer to revolution, and I just had to mention this, uh, you begin chapter 25 with a brilliant sentence. I have to say it's one of my favorite sentences in the entire book, which is revolutions are hard to schedule. <laughs> and so I think that really brings to light, you know, the energy and the chaos and and it just, it was, I really enjoyed that. But it's the conclusion, um, always a rebel, that I really found moving. And you end the book with Ricardo Flores Magón. He's sick. He is living in Edendale on the east side of Los Angeles. And I'm from Huntington Park, so I know that area well. Um, and with the, you know, you see he has a very powerful statement, which is uh, we, are, we have all paid a price for overlooking Latino history. And I wanted to know why at that chapter with his story that you then talk about what it is that we're missing in not including the history of um, the Latino community in, in the US. Well, I think this is why I'm so excited to talk to this group um, in particular is that this book is, it's a smuggling operation really. And, <laughs> and I hope you all join me in this smuggling operation that what I've done is try to take a story that is really riveting. It's got tyrants and spies and deportations and assassins and all that's got all the components of a riveting, compelling tale, cinematic tale. But within it, you can smuggle in key moments in Mexican American history. When does mass migration begin and more important, why? Right, and the answer is US imperialism in Mexico. I can smuggle in the early history of this new form of racial iniquity that's developing in the United States following the US-Mexico war, and that is called Juan Crow. What was it that these Mexican migrants confronted when they arrived in the United States? They confronted racial segregation, housing and education and, and jobs, they confronted racial violence. Um, we talk about the history of anti-Mexican lynchings across the Southwest United States, more than 500 Mexicans and Mexican-Americans 
were lynched between the 1870s and the 1920s. That's a part of the story. In fact, this book about starting a revolution in Mexico begins with a lynching of a Mexican by a white mob in Texas. Um, and there's so many more stories. And so what this book is trying to do is give you something, give a general reading audience um, something dynamic to read. But along the way, you're going to learn a lot about Mexican and Mexican-American history and hopefully say to yourself, um, for the folks who don't know these stories, if I don't know this about how Mexicans and Mexico and Mexican-Americans have been central to the American story, what else do I not know? What book do I need to go read next, right? What young student do I need to support so they can help to tell these new stories? Um, so I guess the, the point of this book in many ways is to expand and amplify our understanding of power in the United States and racial iniquity in the United States, um, the ways in which policing and the carceral state have been expansive and elastic to impact um, non-white immigrant communities, um, all of that is here. And when we haven't told Mexican, Mexican American histories, we've been cut off from understanding really a large segment of our population today and their positionality within the United States. Um, so I think that's what, you know a couple of the reasons why it's absolutely critical that we broaden um, the canon of US history to truly include Mexican and Mexican American history. Um, and there's a lot more work to do. The Magonistas are just, you know, the beginning of, of that story. I was also, one of the things that I didn't know that your book um, highlighted was the efforts by the Magonistas to give land back to right, African-Americans and indigenous and literally to kill white people, <laughs> to dispossess white people. And they had a theory around colonial settlerism. And I, I didn't know that history. And I had actually, I studied the Mexican Revolution. I found that to be fascinating. Could you speak a little bit about that particular part of the history? And um, because it seemed that that was what was most threatening to the US too. Um, and you also do a really beautiful job of showing how U.S. capitalists are really terrified of the revolution and terrified of what could happen not only in the U.S. but to their investments in Mexico. So there's this almost conflation between property, whiteness, and the Magonistas understanding that and, and acting accordingly. That's right. I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question. So I'm going to take a, a little bit of a step back to answer that. Um, what happens uh, during the 19th century, we all know, is that the United States government marches across the North American continent, laying claim to indigenous lands and to what was then claimed as Mexico um, in the spirit of, of manifest destiny, creating new lands for white settler citizens in particular to occupy. With the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1876, the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1876, major US industrialists from the railroads to everything else um, look up and say, what's next? And they find Mexico and they begin to build the railroads into Mexico to go down to Mexico to buy up land on the cheap, basically given to them by Porfirio Diaz. And they begin to stitch together um, the rise of US imperialism. It really takes its first steps in Mexico. And US imperialism, of course, is a white supremacist form of imperialism. And so even in Mexico, um, Anglo-Americans are imported in to become managers, to have the high wage jobs, the safe jobs. And Mexicans, um, indigenous folks, um, are really relegated to low wage, dangerous labor that's often done at the you know, at the end of a whip, right? Um, in the sense that the Mexican police known as rurales are enforcing um, the will of foreign and domestic investors and employers. It's the rise of um, what W. Du Bois would call the glo global color line, right? That helps to define the US-Mexico relationship in the early 20th century. And it's that challenge to the global color line that the Magonistas are bringing. That's important to note because as the Magonistas are challenging a white supremacist form of US imperialism, 
African-Americans are watching very closely. And Gerald, Gerald Horn is one person at least who has done this work to talk about the way in which black folks are watching what's happening in Mexico and hoping that Mexican revolutionaries can really snap the spine of the global color line and create possibilities for all of us to find sanctuary in, in Mexico. And so one of the things that you see happen throughout the Magonisa story is that African-Americans do pop up from time to time. The archive is thin, right? But we have to be able to imagine what is going on behind the archive. That when Ricardo Flores Magon is on the run and he's living as a fugitive and one of the places he comes to is Los Angeles and he finds a, a hideout at the edge of town that his life partner Maria finds for him by um, contacting an African-American real estate broker. So he finds sanctuary within a home that is provided by a black real estate broker here in Los Angeles. And as the Magonistas gear up um, into the revolution, they occupy Baja California in 1911 for several months. And black folks go down to join the occupation with the idea that if the Magonistas, the radical possibilities of revolution can triumph, can win, what might that mean for, for black life, right? And the possibilities of black life in Mexico. Now, of course, all of this is building upon a longer history and trajectory of black freedom seeking in Mexico that stretches all the way back to the period of enslavement where for many of us, um, it wasn't a Northern star, it was a Southern star, that if we could get to Mexico, that would be the place that we could find sanctuary. And so there's a long history between black folks and, and Mexico and, and Mexican rebels um, that this story of the Magonistas is certainly um, a part of. We'd love to hear what you discussed in your breakout sessions. So please share it in the chat if you would like to leave a message in the chat about what your group discussed. That would be great. We especially would love to hear any questions that came up for you that we can help direct to Dr. Hernandez. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Nancy to ask another question as we are uh, collecting other questions from the audience. Okay, hey, thank you, Jesse. So uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask was about the title of the book, why you decided to title the book Bad Mexicans and um, all the multiple meanings of, of bad Mexicans uh, with the book. Okay, great. Thanks for the chance to, to talk about this because it's certainly a, a provocative title. So this group of Mexican dissidents that I'm talking about, Ricardo Flores Magón and his colleagues, began organizing against the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz in Mexico by starting a, a newspaper called Regeneración. And you know, on the pages of that newspaper, they would call Porfirio Diaz a dictator and say that he had made Mexicans the so-called servants of foreigners by um, inviting so many foreign investors into Mexico to buy up land and, and dominate industries. Um, and for these activities, for challenging his regime, um, Porfirio Diaz and his regime um, labeled these rebels malos mexicanos or bad Mexicans um, for not being compliant to the dictatorship. Once they come to the United States, um, really flee um, suppression in Mexico and come to the United States in 1904, they were able to relaunch their newspaper in Texas. They begin in Laredo, then they go to San Antonio and then St. Louis and begin living on the run. They restart their newspaper, Renacion. They establish that political party, the PLM, and they establish this army. And for challenging Porfirio Diaz's rule in Mexico, but also for agitating among Mexican migrant laborers in the United States, who power brokers in the United States, um, white folks in Texas and elsewhere, thought that Mexicans should be docile and compliant and just be laborers who come and go with the seasons sort of quiet and silent within society. By stirring up all this political organizing among Mexican laborers, um, white folks across the borderlands also disparaged the Magonistas as quote, malos mexicanos, right? Or bad Mexicans. Because a good Mexican is a quiet work, right? A bad Mexican is politically engaged and organized and challenging those regimes and those rules. And so that's why I titled this book, um, Bad Mexicans, because it was a, a term that was utilized uh, 
um, by the both the US and the United States governments to try to disparage the organizers. But also, of course, because we recently had a president here in the United States who tried to disparage Mexican migrants as so-called bad hombres. So I'm playing with that. That was very dangerous rhetoric um, to cast an entire group of people as um, bad hombres. But it's also stirring up this history of racial violence against Mexicans and Mexican Americans or non-white immigrants coming from south of the border more specifically. And so I wanted to, um, to call out the danger of that kind of rhetoric that's even being used today. And so to do that, I wanted to um, use this kind of mirrored um, language that was happening in the early 20th century as opposed to what's happening today in the 21st century. So that's re the reason why I call the book Bad Mexicans is that there's so many different ways and so many different angles that this group of politically engaged Mexicanos are being um, disparaged. But in the end, there's this wonderful speech that one of the rebels gives when he's put on trial in Mexico for leading the revolution. His name is Juan Sarabia. And the speech is known as his menace to authority speech, right? Where he is charged with um, insurrection against the Mexican state. And rather than saying, oh, I didn't do it, or you got the wrong guy, he says, hell yeah, I did it, <laughs> right? Let me tell you why I did it. And you're going to call me a bad Mexican for doing it, and I own that, right? Like, yeah, I'm not compliant. And so it's also a part of um, claiming the pride of revolution, right? Or claiming the pride of insurrection. And they did that as, as magonistas, as rebels, is they didn't ever shy away from the fact that um, they were challenging the regime and they never um, sort of bit their tongues, right? Or curbed their words or their politics. They were very um, confrontational and oppositional. Right on. Uh, thank you for that. And we're also getting some great questions in the chat that we're going to move to soon. So thank you for dropping those in the chat and keep them coming. And there's a lot of love coming in the chat as well. Wendy says, thanks, room 15. Uh, Tyrone says, Dr. Hernandez lit that fire. And uh, Keisha said, thank you, Nicole, Suzanne, Shane, Laura, and Esther. Such a great conversation. So it, it sounds like... Uh, there was some great conversations happening in the breakout rooms. Mark says, thanks to Barbara for stepping up. Um, sounds, and then Martha says, thanks Tamara for your energy and enthusiasm facilitating room 18. This is awesome. I think there's sparked a lot of ideas already for uh, lesson plans that can transform our classrooms. And I, I just had one question I wanted to come in with. Uh, before I turn it over to Nancy, because in the first session you you talked about Juan Crow and the racial violence against Mexicans, Mexican immigrants, and I would love if you could talk more about the connection between Juan Crow and Jim Crow. Great, another great question, which is particularly relevant for for K through twelve teachers, right? And how do we get this story into the curriculum? Um, so I always approach U.S. history um, with the presumption and the knowledge that the United States is a white settler state. And what does that mean? That it's predicated upon the occupation of indigenous lands and the theft of, of African black labor. Um, and that that is the baseline of the U.S. story, right? And of U.S. history. Emerging from that um, in post-emancipation as we have an ongoing occupation, right? So as indigenous scholars and Patrick Wolf have taught us, invasion is not an event, it's a structure, right? That continues to this day, the occupation continues to this day. Um, so following enslavement with ongoing occupation, we have the rise of something called Jim Crow. I think many folks are very familiar with of how do you manage and control and extract um, black labor, prevalent, of course, in the US South, but across the United States, wherever black folks are, we have never been imagined as being full incorporated citizens of this white settler state, but rather as bodies and beings from which labor is extracted, and if not, then temporary, right? That's the definition of racism, according to Ruthie Wilson Gilmer and others, is the premature death, right? And so whereas we're not extract getting profit extracted from us, we're on our way toward um, death or extinction. 
When you begin US history with that presumption, then it's easier to understand what happens to non-white immigrants um, as they begin to arrive in the United States in the late 19th century, whether that be Chinese immigrants um, or Mexican immigrants, that the particular form of racial and social control that targets Mexican immigrants in the US-Mexico borderlands or those border states where they um, first have large populations is, you know, it's an echo of what's happening across the United States with Black folks. So anti-Blackness is the basis of everything, right? And from that, you have the growth of, of Juan and Crow. It's not exactly the same. And I would say that it's not as um, regimented where you have significant ex exceptions that are made for white presenting Mexicans or white Mexicans in particular and wealthy Mexican Americans. And there's a considerable number of them um, but the forms of Juan Crow and its um, most violent manifestations certainly target um, brown-skinned indigenous Mexicans who are crossing the border and being told where they can live and where they can't live, where they can go to school, where they can't go to school, what kind of jobs they can have, and who are being um, targeted for um, lynching campaigns. So that's what I would say is Juan Crow. It's a derivative of the white settler state as is Jim Crow. It has its own specificity in the borderlands. And in particular, I would say that it's not as um, singular, right? With the one, one drop rule really impacting all black folks um, in, a, in a shared way. You don't have that happening in, in Juan Crow. With that said, um, one of the distinctions that's happening in Juan Crow is the beginning of this new federal system called immigration control, right? That impacts um, non-white immigrants, Chinese immigrants um, and Mexican immigrants and others. It's beginning to take shape in the early 20th century and be a new um, regime or set of institutions that targets uh, non-white immigrants. So we have a question from uh, in the chat that we're gonna go ahead and ask um, could you talk about the relationship between the Mexican revolutionaries and the early 20th century labor movements in the Southwest, particularly in the mining regions of Arizona and New Mexico? Oh, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> That's a great one. So um, these revolutionaries, the Magonistas, organized in border communities across the US-Mexico border. And some of their strongest holds were in Southern Arizona in Marenchi and in Douglas, um, in these mining towns where Mexican migrant laborers would come over um, and become, become miners and the conditions were horrendous. And so there's a very close connection between the labor movement that Mexican Americans are playing a significant role in in the mines of Southern Arizona and the rise of, of the Magonistas. And I will say that there is a attempted raid that happens um, from Southern Arizona in 1906, where um, miners are joining the PLM army left and right out of Southern Arizona. It ends up getting thwarted by um, the US Immigration Department and others. But the Southern Arizona mines is a hotbed of radical organizing and activity. And it's important to note that they're connecting with the PLM, but they're also connecting with the Socialist Party in the United States. And in time, we're gonna connect with the Wobblies and the IWW, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans, and a large number of indigenous Mexicans, as the work of Deborah Weber has pointed out, play a significant role in the IWW across the Western United States that historians haven't talked about very much. Um, so yes, that's, that's all here, <laughs> the connections between the two. And one of the really interesting things that, that the Magonistas are able to do, they're able to tell US labor organizers, particularly the Anglo-Americans who are trying to figure out, you know, why do we care about a revolution in Mexico? Well, they tell them, well, look, if you think that the Guggenheims and the Rockefellers and the Tahinis and all these folks have too much money, ask yourself where they got all that money. They got it out of the United States, but they also got it out of Mexico. When Porfirio Diaz was giving them all this land and all these tax rebates and all that, they're either making or they're multiplying their millions in Mexico. 
So if you want to take them on, if you want to really cut them off at the knees and really go after their purse that makes it po possible for them to hire spies and Pinkertons and whatnot to shut down the labor movement here in the United States, you have to address what's happening in Mexico. And that pivot is really important because a large number of US socialists, um, Eugene Debs, Mother Jones and others all get on board with the Maguanistas movement and see it as critical to um, strengthening and supporting the US labor movement. That's so wonderful. That, that is history that I feel like I really need to dig into right now, knowing something about the that socialist movement at that time, but not knowing the connections to the Mexican struggle. I feel like I have some homework myself. <laughs> so thank you for that. There's more great questions in the chat. There was a couple people that just asked, what's the name of the Maganista who gave that moving speech? And then there is a question uh, that says, um, from your study, which types of activism were most or least successful in carrying the message of economic and political reform during the revolt against Diaz? Okay, so the first question was, who was the Maguanista who um, gave the menace to authority speech? And his name was Juan Sarabia. And there's actually, if you read Spanish, his biography is freely available online. Um, it was published quite some time ago, but you can check that out. It's um, the title is uh, Juan Sarabia, like a martyr for the revolution. Um, and then the second question was, what were tactics do I think were most successful? I think they were all successful to a certain degree. I'm a all hands on deck kind of organizer, right? So we need intellectuals, we need fighters, we need teachers, we need everything, right? Um, and so the newspaper that they ran, Regeneración, played a significant role in opening up the world of ideas and helping people to build political community across space. When the Magonistas or Regeneración would say, look at this incident of sexual violence that happened in this small town in Mexico, and then they'd spread that story in that newspaper across Mexico, people would start to say, well, wait a minute, we had a similar incident of sexual violence here in our community. Oh, wait a minute, we had a similar experience of sexual violence in our community. And when I say sexual violence, the importance here is that the Porfirio Diaz regime had this sort of localized system of governance called La Jefetura, and he would allow the jefes, right, or the mayors, extraordinary levels of local power. They would tax people to really fill up their coffers, but they also subjected largely women and girls to high levels of sexual violence. And it's when people start to pull these stories together, it's not just me, it's not just my town, this is systemic and endemic, that's how you start to build a revolution, right, as people share those stories. So that was really important work. Building the PLM army was really important work in the sense that when they raided Mexico four times from Texas, from 1906 to 1908, and they were able to rattle that cage of El Pufriato, the, the Diaz regime, to show people you know, maybe he's not that powerful after all. You got ordinary people here, miners, cotton pickers, people who have been dispossessed, who are willing to go in and challenge the arms of the dictatorship. That was important. So there's so many other things that people are doing. Um, I think that it, it's all significant. I would say that one of the, what I regard as shortcomings um, of Ricardo Flores Magón is that he was a brilliant intellectual, but he found his role to be solely intellectual. And while he is encouraging people to go to Mexico to fight, he would never, he never returned to Mexico um, to actually join the fight, or at least even be an intellectual in Mexico as the fighting begins. And I think that that was a shortcoming in terms of tactics among leaders, that if you don't go to the front lines with everybody else, um, that the leadership began, that from my perspective, crumbled at that moment. Um, and with that, I want to say and lift up the name of one other revolutionary who took prominence when Ricardo Flores Magón was incarcerated for three years here in the United States. And that was a, a man named Praxidus Guerrero. He was an unlikely revolutionary. He was born into extraordinary wealth in Guanajuato, raised in a hacienda. He went to school with private tutors and taking equestrian lessons and writing poetry. 
But as a young man, as a late teenager, he decided he was ready to renounce his family's wealth and to travel to the United States and live as a migrant laborer, as so many other Mexicans were beginning to do. And when he was working as a miner, we go back to those Southern mines, Southern Arizona mines. He was working as a miner in Southern Arizona. He met up with um, Manuel Sarabia, a member of the, the PLM, and he joined the PLM. And what's so important about Praxis Guerrero is that he had the power of both the pen and the sword, that he would write these extraordinary pieces, quips really, that help people understand what was happening. Um, like something, I'm gonna get the phrase not quite right, but if you can't get to freedom by walking, then run. Ooh, right? And people would share these quips like wildfire, right? Um, and as one of his more famous quotes was, um, um, it's better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. Everybody heard that phrase from the Mexican Revolution, right? Praxis Guerrero helps bring that to Emiliano Zapata and the Mexican Revolution. So Praxis Guerrero is this writer, but he's got the quips that can be used in oral culture, oral traditions that we move, right? So books are important, but storytelling is probably more important. And I'll say that as a writer, right? Um, but he also is willing to fight. And so he goes down into Mexico several times and he leads several of the raids and he's actually killed in a raid in um, 1910 in the early phases of the Mexican revolution. And so tactically, my, my editor always said, I think you're in love with Praxis Guerrero. And I said, I think you might be right. <laughs> I think you're totally right. Um, I loved his blend of both writer and fighter um, of action and ideas. And so for me, that those are, um, when we can bring all those tactics together, that's where the power is. Oh yes, we fall in love with our subjects, don't we? <laughs> I I had a um, I was going to ask a question about the history because just to kind of amplify that there's also what role do you think the U.S. Mexican War played in this in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo? Because in many ways, the Magonistas are almost fighting against those uh, events that take place, right? And how the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo gives a third of what we know as the United States, not gives, but they take, right? They seize those territories. And then, you know, the question of um, land rights and so forth. And it, it just seems that in many ways, the Mexican revolution is still dealing, still reckoning with what had taken place during that time. Sure. Well, again, when we talk about the United States being a white settler society, the U.S.-Mexico War is certainly a part of that story and the ongoing occupation of all these lands through war and broken treaties. Um, I would say that not only is Mexico still reckoning with that, but here in the United States, we are still reckoning with that. And one of, I, I think, um, areas where we could strengthen some of our, our social movements, racial justice movements, um, environmental movements, whatnot, is in bringing to the fore the idea um, that we are living in the age of occupation. We are living in the age of conquest that didn't happen back then and end. It is happening right now in front of all of that, us, um, around all of us, inside of all of us. Um, so that's, I would say it's not just important for Mexico, it's important for us to take up these questions of land and occupation and indigeneity and how they structure or at least impact questions of racial justice in the United States as well. Yeah, no doubt. I, I know after I teach the Mexican-American War, I uh, usually show an image from one of the immigrant rights rallies with someone holding a sign that says, the border crossed us, we didn't cross the border and ask the kids to discuss the validity of of that's that message right and it's just uh a lot of hypocrisy to talk about uh illegals in the when you look at how illegal that war was to begin with right so thank you for for that um nancy did you have a, a question about la migra yeah um I wanted to ask that and I also wanted to make sure that there's a great question about women in the movement and the role of Jovita Idar. So I wanna give some time for that as well. 
Um, but yes, uh, I, I don't know if people know, but this is, you've written other monographs, <laughs> really award-winning monographs, The City of Inmates, uh, Migra. And so just give an opportunity to kind of expand your research and your work on that in immigration, Migra, with, with this book that you have uh, just written. Sure. So I'm a historian and I, I work largely on immigration, race, and this thing we know as mass incarceration now or, or the carceral state. And one of my first book, or my first book was this book called Migra, and it's a history of the US Border Patrol, looking at the Border Patrol as one of the largest police forces in the United States and how is it that they grow, grew to be so large and in particular to target their resources um, against one population, which at that time was Mexican immigrants. It's increasingly Central American and other nine white immigrants coming across the southern border. I would say that you know we can pick up from our earlier conversation that when you think about the U.S.-Mexico War as being a war of conquest, right, of white settler conquest, uh, we know that at the end of that war, the United States could have taken all of Mexico. We were positioned to seize all of Mexico. We had occupied Mexico City um, and could have taken everything. But the United States negotiators decided that we didn't want all of Mexico because we didn't want Mexicans, right? We didn't want that non-white population, indigenous folks, black folks, right? So at this time, you have to remember at this time, people are conceptualizing Mexicans as being a so-called mongrel mixed breed of African, indigenous, and Spanish. That African piece is huge in the minds of people in the 19th century. We've forgotten that now, right? But it's huge in the minds of people at that point. So the idea of having another um, black population, non-white population incorporated into the United States was anathema to the, to the white settlers at this time period. So they strategized to draw that US-Mexico border in a place that they could get as much land as possible with as few people as possible. So the US-Mexico border is a racial border. It is imagined as being the divide between so-called white settler America and non-white Mexico. Um, my first book, Migra, then goes on to tell the story. If you understand the U.S.-Mexico border in that way, it goes on to tell the story of the establishment of the U.S. Border Patrol as the police force that's supposed to guard the line between so-called mongrel Mexico and white America. And that does a lot to help explain <laughs> the rise of the U.S. Border Patrol and how it um, marshals all the resources, U.S. immigration law enforcement, which could have been and done so many different things. I'm not saying they would have been good things, but could have done so many different things. Going to hospitals to arrest immigrants who had become public charges, they could have done that, right? They could have targeted Chinese immigrants in particular who were um, living under the conditions of Chinese exclusion um, up until after World War II. They could have done a lot of things. But really, the Border Patrol in its beginning was um, most of the Border Patrol officers were white men from the border region, mostly working class white men, who took that power of federal immigration law enforcement and said, nah, we're going to enforce this racial divide that comes between us and our communities here. And they targeted Mexicans in particular. It's almost ironic because up until that point, there really were no rules being implemented against Mexican migrants. The Border Patrol started that story in 1924. Prior to that, people got a, a wink and a nod, Mexican immigrants largely coming across the border. So that's my, my first book, Migra. It tells the story of the rise of the US Border Patrol and that form of racialized policing. Um, I wrote that book because I grew up on the border. I'm from San Diego, California. I grew up watching the Border Patrol police our communities um, in the 80s before Operation Hold the Line. They'd come onto our, into our schools and our buses and our transit stations. They'd snatch people up and take them away. Um, and I'm not from an immigrant family, that, but that terrified me um, watching that happen. And as I grew up and um, experienced, the, as a Black child, the war on drugs when they were coming into our schools and sitting us on curbs and arresting people after um, 10 p.m. I saw a lot of similarities to what was happening to Mexican immigrants and what was happening to us as black youth. And nobody was talking about what the intersections might be. Um, and so I've really spent the last 30 years trying to figure out what are the origins and intersections of anti-blackness and anti-immigrant um, activity in the United States. And so 
Migra was my first investigation into all of that. How was it that the boys in blue could come for us and the boys in green went for them? And what is the relationship between all of that? Then I went on to write a book called City of Inmates, which is about the rise of mass incarceration in Los Angeles. And that really tracks the rise of this form of human caging from the origins of European conquest in Los Angeles um, of indigenous lands that really it's native peoples in what is now known as LA who were the first people to be targeted for criminalization and policing and incarceration. And when you tell the story of mass incarceration from that moment of occupation, the criminalization of indigenous communities, all of a sudden this regime that has grown looks like, yes, it's about labor control, absolutely. And it's about racial capitalism, absolutely. But it's also about these stories of conquest and elimination that as the United States comes in, tries to remove indigenous populations to literally eliminate them from the landscape, policing and incarceration is part of that story of elimination. And all non-white populations who come into LA um, after that, LA is known as the Aryan city of the sun, right? The ideal white settler society, um, the late 19th century, early 20th century. All stories of incarceration following that um, are part of this cauldron of elimination. And why this is so important for black folks, and I will say this again and again, is that um, the history of black folks in the American West is the canary in the coal mine for black life in the United States. What happens when black people, when we have pushed ourselves into a region where there is no imagination for our life whatsoever and also no dependence upon our labor? The answer is elimination. And that's what we've seen with the rise of mass incarceration in Los Angeles. The answer um, and across the American West for the impossibility of black life in this white settler society um, is the rise of the carceral state to remove us from the streets, to remove us from our communities, remove us from life. And so that's what City of Inmates is about. Is, um, it's about a lot of things, but it's about finding the intersections of um, indigenous, well, what we now call BIPOC, indigenous people of color and black folks histories around the carceral state and how at least in LA and across the American West that begins with indigenous removal. And now we have the story about Mexicans, which is about this incredible group of, of rebels who challenged all of this. Um, I will say that many of the Magonistas, um, when we talked about their you know, their fallibility earlier, Nancy, one of the other pieces or areas where they had a, a limited imagination was around Asian immigrants and Chinese immigrants in particular. So during this time period, the Maguanistas would rail against capitalism and, and rail against multiple forms of racial iniquity, but would target Chinese immigrants for exclusion and, and removal. Um, but beyond all that, you have this incredible group of rebels who was who are grappling with the issues of the day and trying to imagine something um, radically different. And as someone who grew up in the borderlands and was never told about them, right? I was never told about the radical history of Mexican immigrants and what that might mean for us as young black youth, right? Trying to organize with them. That that's, those are stories that I wanted to hear that I needed to know. And so um, like that's you know, part of the very personal reasons why I write some of these stories. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, thank you for sharing that. There was a great question in the chat I thought I would just ask. And then Nancy, if you have a last one that you want to ask as well, that'd be cool. Well, someone asked uh, if you've uh, sold the film rights yet and if, the, <laughs> if we're going to get to see this book on the big screen. But then we have, we have another question. Um, I am attending this class from the city of Limerick, Ireland, birthplace of John or Juan Cray Key, who was supposed to have fought and organized alongside Magon, global solidarity and action uh, in a time before the internet. So I just wanted to share that with you and thought that was awesome to hear too. Nancy, did you have another um, question? Yeah, I just wanted to circle back and give Kelly an opportunity to talk about the women in the, uh, the Magonistas or women revolutionaries, whether they're Jovita y Dad. I mean, you also mentioned Josefina Fierro, the bride in the book. And so anything that you'd like to discuss? 
Sure. Well, um, often when the Magonistas are written about, Ricardo Flores Magon and the men are at the center of the story. And so I didn't, you know, I absolutely spent time thinking about and doing the work to amplify and highlight the role of women. At minimum, and this is truly at minimum, when Ricardo Flores Magon is incarcerated, the so-called leader of La Junta, right? Um, it is women who hold the movement together. How do they do that? Well, we, they smuggled this rebel correspondence to him back and forth in jail. I think we talked about that earlier in terms of the, oh, we didn't, I'm sorry, I'm giving so many talks. Okay, you have to know this part. All right. So Ricardo Flores Magon is arrested in Los Angeles in August 1907 in this dramatic raid on a hideout at the edge of town. And he's put into solitary confinement in the LA city and county jail. And from solitary confinement, um, people expect him and the revolution to die. You take out the head of the revolution, the revolution's gonna die, right? Not at all. How? Well, Ricardo's life partner, a woman named Maria Bruce de Talavera, would come to the jail and say, oh, you know, I'm just his, his wife. I'm just um, a woman. And what I want to do is come and, and wash his clothes for him. He's got dirty clothes. I have to take care of my man, right? Well, she would pick up those dirty clothes, take them home, and then sew rebel correspondence into the seams of his pants and his underwear, and then send that clo those clothes back into the jail. So and that's how she kept the rebel correspondence moving back and forth. And in June of 1908, right before those big raids um, that trigger the response from the FBI, she also goes to visit Ricardo Flores Magon in the LA County Jail. And they're talking in the visitor's room and Ricardo drops something and Maria swoops her giant skirt um, around this note and puts it into her purse and you know, runs out the jail and smuggles what are effectively battle plans for the 1908 raids out of the LA County Jail and hands them to Praxidus Guerrero, the great fighter, right? Who takes them and um, fights. So Maria is just one of the examples. She did a whole lot more before uh, Ricardo was incarcerated as well. I wanna tell you about one more woman who's um, highlighted in this book and her name is Juana Belen Gutierrez de Mendoza. Someone could put that in the chat for the folks. Juana Belen Gutierrez de Mendoza. She is a brilliant autodidact um, queer woman from the mountains of Durango who begins her rabble rousing as an advocate for minors in Mexico. So they're getting paid too little and they're working too hard and she's an advocate. She's arrested so many times in Mexico that she decides rather than signing her name on her jail slips, she's where it says you're supposed to put your name, she starts to put sedition and rebellion. <laughs> Right. So she starts to sign her name, Sedition and Rebellion. She joins up with um, Ricardo Flores Magon and the others in Mexico City. She launches an anarchist feminist newspaper called Vesper. When they all have to flee and come to the United States, she comes with everybody and she continues to organize. When Ricardo Flores Magon begins to grow in power, and some people say that he should be the president following Porfirio Diaz, it's Juana who says, no, we're not here for any individual to replace Porfirio Diaz. We're here for a set of principles. And she fights for those principles. And she and, and Ricardo really go toe to toe on this when nobody else is really willing to challenge Ricardo yet. She ends up leaving the Magonistas um, because she and Ricardo um, go their separate ways. You know what she does next? She goes on to join Emiliano Zapata's army and helps to ghostwrite his plan de Ayala and goes on for years as an advocate for women's rights and workers' rights um, in Mexico. She's extraordinary. So thank you, Anel um, and others, Maria, for putting her name in the chat. We all have to know Juana Belen Gutierrez de Mendoza, um, who's extraordinary. Oh, incredible stories. Thank you so much. Dr. Hernandez, Nancy, thank you so much for so many great questions that will help us all in the classroom uh, bring these stories to life with, with our students. Uh, so exciting to have a better understanding of this so that we can teach the truth 